Welcome back to another episode of Full Proof Theology. My name is Chase Davis and I'm your host. It's great to be with you here again. We're going to talk with Owen Anderson about things going on at ASU where he's a professor. You might have seen him featured on Fox News or other places. Uh, really doing great work. He's a professor down at ASU, like I mentioned. But we've had him on the podcast before, having him on the podcast here again today. But really, besides ASU, we're going to talk about his new commentary on Revelation, which I find uh, very helpful. We have a great conversation on a variety of matters related to how Christians have understood Revelation historically, but also how we can read it. And it can uh, be helpful for us as Christians to glorify God in every area of our life. Before we get into today's episode, I want to make sure you know about a great product I use called Ion Layer. Here's the deal. As you get older, your NAD plus levels drop. Uh, I know you may be asking, what is an NAD plus level? Let me just tell you, it affects a lot of things going on in your body. These are essential for mitochondrial function. They, they affect your energy recovery, your sleep, your mental acuity. And so I use these things called ion layers, these patches. Uh, they came out with kind of this technology back uh, a while ago. But Ion Layer has adopted this technology used in the medical field for people who are allergic to IVs, and you can get NAD plus treatments through a patch with Ion Layer. This is great because not only is it a, a different way than getting an IV treatment, but it's much, much, much affordable than an IV treatment, which is typically thousands of dollars. This is not that. And so I want you to head over to IonLayer.com, use code FPT. You get $100 off your first kit ionlayer.com use code fpt to get hundred dollars off your first kit these things help like i said with uh recovery after a workout energy mental acuity all that kind of stuff so head over to ionlayer.com use code fpt get hundred dollars off your first kit it also comes with a with a 30-day money back guarantee so it's no brainer you can try it out if it doesn't work for you get all your money back so check that out and let's get into today's episode this afternoon i'm recording here with owen anderson and Owen is down in Phoenix, Arizona. He's a pastor. He's a professor. We're going to have a lot of fun conversations about his work and uh, stuff going on at ASU, but also his new book. He has a book coming out on Revelation. We're going to talk a lot about that as well. So Owen, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I'm really glad to be back with you. So before we get into your book, which is the main reason I wanted to talk to you, but I've got to ask, I mean, we've had yep. you on the podcast before, talked a lot of philosophy. If you're a listener or you're watching on YouTube, you can go find that episode uh, pretty easily, but I think a lot has changed in the last yeah. uh, few years. And so uh, I think the main thing, I, th I think I saw you on Fox News, things are happening at ASU, kind of bring people up to speed with what's going on down there. Yeah. So there's a, there's a, a couple things happening right now that should be of interest to Christians in general, let alone if you're a, you're a parent of a college age uh, child or you're a college age person. Uh, so the first one is that I'm involved in a court case against ASU in Arizona for required DEI training. So employers can have training they require their employees. For example, we, we have to take technology security training so we don't give out passwords on the internet and, and uh, fire training. But this training it claims to teach about diversity, inclusion, and equity. But what it actually does is it has a whole segment on the problem of whiteness. And so I objected and said, hey, I I think that's wrong. If, if this is not about inclusion, this seems to be about race blame. And there's an, an Arizona law which prohibits public schools from engaging in race blame or gender blame, which should be obvious, um, but I guess it's not anymore. So the Goldwater Institute is representing me against ASU in this case, and we should be going to oral arguments either later this month or early October. Wow, that's pretty exciting. I mean, um, I don't know of another professor that's doing this with a uh, public university. So, I mean, kudos to you. Hopefully the case goes well. That's coming up, you said, in September, October is when the case yeah, is going to be. Yeah, we should go before, before the judge because uh, they've already done a number of papers between Goldwater and ASU's lawyers. But now we'll go before the judge and argue the case late September, early October. So I appreciate prayers. And the issue at stake is, is, is a First Amendment issue that employers can't force you to change your beliefs. They can make you sit through certain kinds of training, but they can't force you to change your beliefs. And that's what this does. And it specifically is very anti-Christian because it says that the last, it's especially focuses on the last 500 years as the time of whiteness. So behind mm. the direct attack on a white man, what you'll see is it's really an attack on Christianity, on the yeah. Reformation, on Christian missions, on Christian education. That's the real, the real attack. And so it comes in the guise of, hey, let's just be inclusive. And I agree. 
at state university, you got to be inclusive. It's a pluralistic setting. Um, but you are inclusive of everyone, including Christians. And I saw if you don't follow Owen online, you can follow him. He's regularly providing updates. It feels like letters from the front lines as far <laughs> yeah. as, you know, him reporting back on different things. Wasn't there something about you wanted to teach on Christian history or teach a class mm -hmm. on Christianity and yep. you were getting a lot of pushback from that? Is that right? Yeah, I actually, I've been teaching at ASU for 24 years. I'm a tenured professor, so this should not be an issue. But ASU right now is redoing their general education requirements. And for those who don't know what that means is that in order to graduate, let's say you want to be an engineer or a nurse, universities still require you to take classes outside of your major, usually in humanities. And so those are called general education requirements. And it's it's not a big deal to redo those. But I teach a class very often called Introduction to Christianity. It's a 200 level class. And so in order to, to keep my humanities general education designation, I had to submit my syllabus. And again, this should be just basically a rubber stamp because I've been teaching this class at ASU. Well, I, I had to submit it to the other schools that also teach the class. I, I'm in a humanities school. And so we submitted it to the religious studies school. And they sent it back and said, no, we won't approve this syllabus. Uh, it's taught from a Christian perspective. And I, so I asked, well, can you give me examples of what that perspective is? Because besides the fact that I'm a Christian, everything in here is something a secular student should know. And so the reasons they sent back is that I mentioned Western civilization too often, that I seem to, by using the phrase Old Testament, I seem to imply the Christians replace the Jews, called supersessionism, they called it. And so I shouldn't use the word Old Testament, or if I do, I have to say, I have to point out the Jews don't think it's the Old Testament. Now, keep in mind, we have a whole class on Judaism, many, many classes on Judaism. So the students can learn that. This is introduction to Christianity, and the Christians think it's the Old Testament. And they said the idea of a biblical worldview, I, I have a, a section on biblical worldview. They said that's simplistic, and you got to get rid of that. And then they had objections about the line of Christianity in the sense that um, why do I cover, for example, the English Reformation, but I don't really seem to focus on anything in South America? Now, that's not true because South America particularly gets influenced by Christianity in the last 500 years, modernity. And so I have a whole section on modernity. But then they said other things that were humorous, like you need to include something about North Africa. Well, I've got a, my favorite theologian, guess where he's from? Augustine, North Africa, right? It's right there in the syllabus. And they say, well, you need to include the Eastern church. Well, again, got a whole segment, a whole week or two on the church fathers. Most of those were 70% were from the East. So it's just like they didn't either, they didn't read it or they were looking for something wrong with it. But what's great for me is they put in writing, this is being taught from a Christian perspective. So it's not just me saying this as an email right there. So I'm going forward with that as, as a big problem also, because there's no reason why this should be a, an issue at all. Yeah, absolutely. That's crazy. And, you know, just like any public secular university nowadays, you get all sorts of stuff on campus. Um, it's no different here at University of Colorado. But I did I did see something you recently uh, put about witchcraft. There's witchcraft yeah. being taught at the university. Is this true? Yeah, well, I was on a, I was on with Frank Turek. If people want to look up his I'm not trying to to. Uh, promote other uh, podcasts on your show. Uh, but no, you're fine. You're fine. He put that up on YouTube and um, he was interviewing me about this other stuff about Christians at ASU. And towards the end of our interview, I mentioned that the honors professors promote witchcraft. And he said, well, why did you wait till now to say that? Let's do a, let's do a whole special issue on that. So we did a, we did two. The second one that came out today is about this witchcraft thing. And I, I have a sub stack. I'd really appreciate everyone's support. It's free. You just go there. It's Dr. Dr. Owen Anderson. And you'll see I have this posted. It's about a year or a year and a half ago. Um, the Honors College had an event promoting the benefits of witchcraft, especially for feminist causes. And Jeez. so, yeah, there is. But then two weeks ago, they had an event. And this is what I do on my sub stack. I just kind of post stuff. I'm just, like you said, I'm almost just a news reporter of what is going on in the front lines. Well, here it is. Yeah. Um, they had an event two weeks ago about the benefits of polyamory. So we got witchcraft, wow. we got polyamory, and I put a dilemma to the honors professors because ASU has a, as, as a well-known honor school. A lot of parents might be really glad to say, hey, I'm going to get my kid into this honor school. It's, it's supposed to be a great books style honor school. It's not, uh, unless great books means the, you know, this works of witchcraft or something. But 
when you walk into their front office, they've got a display of professors' books. And the, the last time I saw it is all witchcraft books. So what I put to them is a dilemma, which I think your you and your audience were like. When we're in high school, did you have to read The Crucible by Arthur Miller? It's really I standard. I don't think so. Maybe I did. That's about the Salem witch trials. So it's pretty standard. Oh, okay. High school students yeah. got to read about how evil, evil Salem Puritans persecuting witches. And it's really for, for Arthur Miller, it's really a story about Joseph McCarthy hunting down Marxists. So either way, it's like the good guys are the Marxists or the witches. The bad guys are the Christians. And every high schooler has been reading that for decades. Okay, so the story there is that witches, the, the Puritans were, were nuts because witchcraft is not real. They were afraid of something that doesn't really exist. These are just proto-feminists trying to have a voice in society. But now, the Honors College is reversing it, and they're saying witchcraft is absolutely real, and it has a lot of good benefits. Right. Well, wait, then the Puritans yeah. had a good reason to be concerned about it. You can't have it both sure. ways. Yeah. That's a great point, <laughs> man. So a lot's going on. Yeah. I'll, I'll put a link for the listener to your sub stack in the, you, uh, yeah. in the show notes and uh, I'll put a link to your Twitter as well. So people can follow up there, but why don't we get into your book on revelation mm -hmm. among, among the many things you've got going on, tenured professor, obviously you got this case coming up. You've written this book, this commentary on revelation, a doxological reading. I mean, when I uh, heard about this book, I was kind of like, okay, I was a good guy. You know, I want to give it a fair shake there are a lot of resources on revelation out there for Christians. Mm -hmm. um, and so what, what kind of unique contribution are you adding to kind of the, the study of revelation? Do you think, why is it important for Christians to know or have your particular book on revelation? Yeah, it's a great question because it's pretty much, if you go to a Christian bookstore, a third to half of it is dedicated to revelation or prophecy somehow. But I saw how successful Hal Lindsey was. And I thought I better get in on that racket. No, I'm just, I'm just joking. Um, it's part of a larger series I'm doing. I'm calling them philosophical commentaries. I, my first one was on Job. And what I did there was I treated Job as a philosophical dialogue. And I, I argue that Job is the first, really the first philosopher. And he far excels Socrates. So when I say philosophical dialogue, I don't mean secular. Uh, I'm a believer. I'm reformed. But I just mean we're looking at the philosophical problems that came up in Job and showing how he answers the problem of evil much better than other philosophers do. So I'm using that same kind of method now over to Revelation. And it's the same sort of theme, which is what kinds of problems does the book of Revelation solve for us that secular philosophers really stumble on and can't answer? And so I think that includes things like what is our highest good and how does good overcome evil? Now, the difference between Job and Revelation, of course, is Job is pretty much a straightforward dialogue. Whereas Revelation is saturated in symbolism and it's the last book of the Bible. And so that's part of the argument I make is that you really need to have understood all the first part, including the biblical worldview, if I'm still allowed to say that at ASU, uh, of creation, fall, redemption. And then also the symbolism um, in Isaiah and Ezekiel in order to understand what is John doing in this book. Okay, that's great. And you call it a doxological reading. Uh, tell me more about how we read books doxologically. Yeah, so it is a post-millennial reading, and I'm relying on uh, reform post-millennial authors. And so my idea is to help draw the, the Christian discussion away from pre-mill dispensationalism. Minimally, that view should have been shown to be false just empirically, given the number of false predictions they've made. So many Christians are saying we need more. Uh, and so a mill and post mill are are good options. And so I'm also arguing against a mill. Why is post mill? And so I I just make the case throughout the book that God's goal is stated in Isaiah 11:9 that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. So that's the glory of God shining in the world, and that is the outcome of the Great Commission. So the premillennial view will say that Christians completely fail in the, pre, the Great Commission so that Christ has to return and set things right. Whereas in the postmillennial view, we say, no, the Christians succeed. They do disciple the nations, not just convert one or two people from every nation. They actually disciple the nations. And by doing that, they fill the earth with the glory of the knowledge of God or the knowledge of the glory of God. Yeah, if we could, a couple of things in there I want to talk about. With dispensationalism, I mean, 
the average evangelical in America, I think it's fair to say, kind of operates or views Revelation uh, from a dispensational perspective. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how much kind of research you've done into the dispensational movement. I haven't ever dedicated a, an entire episode to it. Um, so I don't know if you're familiar with it enough to talk about, but what, what are some major yeah. problems that, that yeah. dispensationalism uh, kind of presents? Because as far as I know, my, my you know, kind of incubation in dispensationalism, I grew around uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, a famous mm -hmm. kind of dis disby seminary. And a lot of the Bible teachers I had in high school were mm -hmm. uh, kind of from that background. Um, but it was kind of a 19th century movement, uh, Darby, yeah. Schofield, these kind of guys um, that kind of uh, created a new hermeneutic uh, that was, uh, I mean, fairly novel at the time, but mm -hmm. also uh, incredibly popular and pervasive and mm -hmm. really attached itself to uh, kind of neo-evangelicalism in the mid 20th century. New institutions were started like Moody Bible. Mm -hmm. What am I missing there? What do listeners need to know about dispensationalism and why it's a problem? Yeah, so that and that's a good overview. Those are good good points. The things I would add is, and for our conversation to distinguish between historic pre mill and dispensational pre mill. So now we're on dispensational pre mill, and the idea was that God works in history in different dispensations or eras, and there's seven of them rather than just two. And what happens is that the world gets worse and worse in this one we're in until Christ returns. So I'll, I'll clarify some terminology here. The millennium is Christ's rule after his second coming. So sometimes called a golden age. And the pre, ah, and post are about when does that happen? When does Christ return? So the premillennialist says he returns at the beginning and sets that up. The amillennialist says there really isn't one of those. The city of man and the city of God they might go back and forth, one doing better than the other at different times, but they continue parallel until the end of history. And the post millennialist says, no, the church grows and the, the, the city of man shrinks and the church grows to fill the whole world. And then that's the millennium. And then Christ returns. So that's what's being discussed. Now, when I grew up, it sounds like we were similar. I thought the only different views of if someone said, what view do you have a revelation? I thought that meant pre mid or ah trib or post-trib, right? right? When does right. Christ return in the tribulation? But the, the amillennialists and the post-millennialists both agree that the tribulation is the spiritual battle taking place in the church age, not a one-time future battle with he Apache helicopters and Abrams tanks in the Middle East. So right. there, it, it, this, what this does is it presents a whole new complexity and, and whole new vista, a whole new world to people who had been confined to just this Left Behind series view and it is a very hopeful view because the, the primo dispensational view, it, it was it was around the 1800s and the 1800s did have quite a number of millennial movements. Many of them were cults, um, thinking that the utopia was just about to be established without having disciple the nations. But the 20th century is what made it do really well because you had European hubris in the 1890s and 1900s saying, we've ended all wars. We're so civilized. We're, we're right on the cusp, basically, of the millennium because of our technology and our diplomacy. Well, then they were all humiliated with World War I, which was just absolute nonsense. Uh, and they couldn't avoid it. And they slaughter each other. And then they think, OK, maybe we're doing better. And then World War II. And then we get the invention of the atomic bomb, which can destroy the world. And so for a lot of pre-mill dispensationalism, this just took off. And people said, yeah, we're just about at the end. I mean, this is the end of history. Someone's going to nuke someone. And so Christ must be about to return. And so those historic events were interpreted that way. And I think that's a problem because that's a misinterpretation of history. It shows that Christians weren't prepared or had forgotten what we've been taught about how to understand God's providence. And that's perhaps the most important thing. If Job, if I focused in Job on the clarity of, of general revelation, because God, when he speaks to Job, goes over natural theology with Job. The book of Revelation is about God's providence. Christians should know God's providence. And, and here's the thing. They externalize suffering like the world wars. And they say this is going to be about the end of history. Rather than saying, no, the book of Revelation teaches us that God rules through natural evil. And the three summaries of that are old age, sickness and death, or uh, famine, war, and plague. And that was true in Genesis 3. When man sinned, God imposed uh, old age, sickness, and death. And we see it throughout the Old Testament history. We see it in the prophets. 
when God brings Assyria or Babylon to punish his people. And we know it's still true. We will live now. And so what Revelation does is it helps us see that Christ is currently ruling. He rules in the world through natural evil to call humans to repent before him. Okay, so there's a, a few kind of, since it's a, a commentary, a doxological reading, I, I I was curious to get your thoughts on several things in the book yep. of Revelation. One um, would be, and, and typically when I teach, I te teach from an awe mill. People mm -hmm. to my listeners to my podcast will know I'm very friendly to post mill. I just, a lot of these labels are 20th century kind of like theological constructions. And when you read the reformers and other people, they weren't necessarily using this terminology, but mm -hmm. awe mill is my most kind of like, you know, comfortable which just so happens to be the most like easy because it's very vague and you don't have to go dispy. You also don't have to go post mill, but I'm more friendly to post mill. So with that kind of being well, said, ask, though, do you, do you take the, the name optimistic on mill? Yes. Yeah. I've oh. taken that before. Yeah. When I've talked with uh, Doug Wilson and others, optimistic yeah. on mill is one I, I happily embrace. So yeah, there's well, a difference. And, and between I, I understand hundred percent what you mean, but the first time I heard That's another on mill uh, pastor dispute that, I was at a ordination service in the OPC and it was during the questioning part. And, and the, the person said, I'm optimistic, Amil. And, and one of the Amil pastors said, there's no such thing because oh, wow. Amil, and I'm not saying you believe this or that every Amil thinks right. this, but for me, it was eye opening for what some Amil think. He said, Amil teaches that the essential nature of the church is suffering and it never overcomes sure. that until the end. Whereas optimistic, right. In, is really just a kind of post mill, which says, no, we increasingly fill the earth with the knowledge of God. Yeah, exactly. So when I'm teaching this kind of stuff to just normal people who show up at the church or anyone else, uh, you know, several questions come up. One, what do we do about the rapture? The Bible seems to talk about the rapture. People believe there's a rapture. Help, help listeners understand when we see in Thessalonians and Revelation, these other things, uh, how are Christians to conceive of if there is a rapture or what that means. Yeah. So the rapture describes when Christ returns and there's a resurrection of the dead, not everybody's physically dead. So those who are alive don't need to be raised from the dead. Instead, they're caught up with Christ in the clouds and they return with him and the dead are raised. So that occurs at the resurrection of the dead. And we know from John that there's one resurrection of the just and the unjust. There's not separate resurrections. And so that occurs at the end of history after the nations have been discipled, after the Great Commission's finished. Okay, In contrast great. to with, with the Kirk Cameron view and Left Behind, there could be more than one resurrection and more than one rapture instead of saying, no, there's right. one resurrection of the just and the unjust. Jesus is very clear about that. Yeah. And it's it's funny that Kirk Cameron is post mill now. I, I kind of get it. Is he really? No way. After yeah. I didn't yes. know yeah, that. I'll send you a link. God bless him. That's <laughs> yes. wonderful. <laughs> well, I'm amazing. looking forward to the, the um, post mill movie that he's going to make. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, okay, great. So that kind of uh, deals with with that uh, tension that a lot of people feel. The other one would be the binding of Satan. Um, you know, there seems to be a not seems to be there's biblically in Revelation talks about a, Satan is bound. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. How are Christians to understand this? I mean, from a dispensational perspective, uh, there's a lot of confusion about this, what mm -hmm. this means. How are Christians to understand the binding of Satan? Yeah, what's as I dug into reform sources on this, for me it was really helpful because I had all I had also misunderstood Isaiah speaking about Luce, seeing Lucifer cast out of heaven, and I thought, okay, that was that was primordial, and then you've got the future binding of Satan, and instead, I think that the binding of Satan is the cross. That's when he lost his kingdom and was cast down. And this is the time now when he's bo he's bound by the gospel going to all the world, which it had him before. And so he's the strong man that must be tied up if you're going to steal from his house. And so Christ bound right. him and Christ currently rules. And that for me, that was the, the thing that just changed my outlook. I was a freshman in college. And when it clicked in my mind, wait a minute, Christ rules right now, not after a tribulation. Everything that happens is under the sovereign rule of Christ. For me, that was just a game changer in thinking about this. And then the second one was what I mentioned earlier, which is that suffering, like a play, uh, uh, war, famine, plague, those are the things that God's using in providence to either discipline the unbeliever or to call the believer to repent. And usually those are presented in the pre-mill theory as the enemies. 
And so that's one mystery that I ask my readers to try to figure out. Who is this rider on the white horse accompanied by war, famine, and death? And they usually say, well, he must be like a bad guy or something. Well, he's riding out to conquer the world, and he's described the same way as the Son of God later. This is Christ, and he rides out with those things in judgment, just like is described in the Old Testament in Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel. Yeah, it's a fascinating, uh, uh, not just wrinkle, but uh, approach that makes a lot more sense once you, like you said, kind of take into the books that came prior, other other sources, rather than just looking at Revelation exegetically or uh, from certain her hermeneutical perspectives. Uh, one of the things, as you get into Revelation, because there are so many books out there, um, I think most literature I've engaged with hasn't been a doxological reading. It's been more of a verse by verse. Mm -hmm. You know, when I've preached Revelation before, that's what it's been. I try to incorporate, mm -hmm. you know, various commentaries from various times uh, to yeah. make sure it's a, a well-crafted sermon. But when you approach it hermeneutically and even in your doxological reading, when we're reading Revelation, we come to the text. Are you seeing cycles of kind of mm -hmm. repeat? Because this is a common theme out there. Are you seeing cycles of like um, in in the actual presentation by John? of of the same events going ongoing in the text yeah. or is it do you read it more uh chronologically right. where there's not cycles it's just an unfolding of a prophecy and a, a, a telling of a story before we hear from owen anderson on that question i want to make sure you know about hillsdale college here's the deal if you're a guy the internet has proven it to be true the roman republic is always on your mind you are always thinking about what would have happened if the Roman Empire didn't fall, how it fell, what happened, what went wrong. Maybe you're looking at the American regime failing today, and we live in a time of cacophony and nonsense today, and you're like, are we in decline? Well, yes, we're in decline, but we should learn the lessons of the Roman Empire. And so I want to make sure you know about a great way to learn the lessons of the Roman Empire, and that's through Hillsdale College. Hillsdale College has free online classes that are taught by world-class instructors, and you can head over there to check out their series on the rise and fall of the Roman public. Not only that, they have tons of other great resources on C.S. Lewis, the book of Genesis, a bunch of other online courses, over 40, that you can go over to Hillsdale College, sign up today. I think it's a great resource for you to become educated, uh, become well-read, all that kind of stuff. It's a at-your-own-pace course, and they're free to the public. So head over to hillsdale.edu slash proof to enroll. It's no cost, and it's easy to get started hillsdale.edu slash proof to register today so you can let them know that I sent you. Let's get back into today's interview. Yeah, so those are a couple of the different ways that the reformers thought of the book. So, so Luther thought of it as kind of a uh, overview or outline of history from Christ to the end. So it's just kind of giving you an overview of some of the main events. Um, the post-mill reformers thought of it instead as seven descriptions of the same battle from different perspectives, just like we got four gospels that give us different perspectives to fill in all the details. You're given seven perspectives of the same spiritual battle. Now, that doesn't mean that it isn't in the world. Uh, this is the spiritual battle unfolding in the world, but it's, it's reminding of Paul saying that we don't fight with weapons of this world. We fight with uh, spiritual weapons. And so it is true that there's real plagues, there's real famines, there's real wars, but really, the conflict that we're that we're told about in Revelation in seven different ways is a conflict between belief and unbelief, and how belief finally conquers and Christ, the knowledge of God, fills the whole world. So I think one of the verses right away, what we're told in chapter one, verse three: "Blessed is he who reads, and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near." So. That says that anyone who reads this book, whether it's a first century Galilean or a uh, uh, 500s at the end of Rome, 1500s at the beginning of the Reformation, or today, anyone who reads it, the time is near. So what I do is I argue against two other views, a very common view. It actually comes out of the Jesuits, but some reform guys are, are going back to it called preterism. And that view says all of this or most of it's in the past. But that would make verse 1, 3 false because it means everyone living after that, the time isn't near anymore. The time's not near for us. Or there's another view, also Jesuit, the premillennial view, which says it's all in the future. But again, that means that for most people, this wasn't near them. So I read that to be saying that the spiritual war described in this book is happening throughout the Christian age. 
And each one of us, whichever one of those times we live in, is going to be engaged in that war. And, and that pattern is set up right away with the seven churches, because these aren't, these aren't the only churches in Asia Minor. It's not an exhaustive list, but it's a, a list of seven, and it goes in a, in a cycle around Asia Minor to alert us to the main problems that are going to come up for churches. Okay, great. If we could, I wanted to dive into a text I've been meditating upon, if you'll put it that way, mm -hmm. just considering kind of mulling over my head, chewing on in Revelation 2. And I wanted to read yep. um, a section from it. And I just have a couple of questions. As someone who's written this commentary, um, uh, I have a speculative theory that I haven't, I've looked into several commentaries. I haven't seen this view represented and maybe you have. And so I wanted to float a theory out there. I haven't taught this, yeah, sure. just <laughs> saying it out loud. So sure. Revelation 2, 18, uh, and unto the angel of the church in Thyatra write, these things saith the son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works in charity and service and faith, thy patience in thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach to, and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed on idols. And I gave her space to rent, repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches, searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But I say unto you and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which you already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works until the end, to him I will give the power, I will give power over the nations, and ye shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star, he, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. I'm reading from the King James Version. My my reading of this is, is uh, like I said, speculative, uh, something I've been thinking about. But I wonder how much of this has to do with feminism in our day. Uh, I don't want to make it too directly applicable, mm -hmm. but we we see in here, you know, sexual sin. Uh, this this woman Jezebel. Uh, you you hear some uh, pastors in the more charismatic tradition will talk about a spirit of Jezebel, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and then the church. Well, the feminists adopted uh, that, right? They have, they have the Jezebel magazine. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. And then the she's cast down. She's conquered. And at the end, I'm I'm curious. He shall rule them, the nations. And I'm I'm curious about he who is he? He shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the ve vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received my father. It seems to me that it would be Jesus speaking of the church ruling the nations with a rod of iron, and that he gives power over the nations to his church. Is that a fair? I mean, whether whether the Jezebel yeah, I think hundred percent it might is just a day. I'm using the uh, New right. King James, so it's very similar. It's the uh, R.C. Sproul Study Bible. So they have nice. have a footnote here. Yeah, that's just from Psalm 2, which is about the Son of God okay. ruling the nations. So 100%. Right. And I think the problem that happens in the, in the letters is that they can be spiritualized in a way that no longer applies to the actual churches they're written to. So someone will say, right. well, that's about – that's the that's the harlot in the next chapters – and it's, it's being overcome in the future, and the harlot sits on seven hills, so that's the city of Rome. Uh, and so I, I explain in my commentary why those kinds of readings don't work and how to avoid them and how to understand this, because I think he's writing to a real problem in the city, and but it's also a spiritual problem that we'll face. So there's a couple things here. One is when it says that her children will be killed, people can say, whoa, whoa, that's that's harsh. Well, I think this is just 1 Corinthians 11 when Paul is explaining, examine yourself before you come to the Lord's Supper or you some have gone to sleep. If you don't do that, some have died. And so here's a church that's giving the Lord's Supper. Her children are her converts or disciples, and they're not obeying. Examine yourself. And so that's just a fulfillment of 1 Corinthians 11 that's taught already earlier. But then, yeah, she I think you're right that she's whether it's modern feminism or, or even just what Eve did putting herself in the place that she shouldn't be. And it almost always involves some kind of sexual liberation. So whether it was in this church or you got medieval examples and you got contemporary examples, 
it always involves, hey, let's just be free with our bodies. God wants us to enjoy ourselves. So I think that alerts us to the fact that, hey, churches, and especially pastors, I think the the letters, when it says to the angel, I believe that means to the pastor of this church. Okay. Pastors, be aware of this problem. It will come up just like it did in the past. That makes sense. And so when it talks about ruling the nations with our iron, like you said, Psalm 2 makes complete sense. That's kind of because I was singing Psalm 2 and uh, I've preached on Psalm 2 before. That was already kind of like, you know, in my mm-hmm. mind. Then I read this passage and I'm like, this rod of iron, man, yeah. look. And, and my your imagination starts going, what would it look like for the church? I mean, we could get into a whole lot of political yeah. theology and all that kind of stuff, which yeah. is outside the scope of the podcast. But it, it is an interesting concept for the church to be empowered in such a way to rule the nations with a rod of iron. We could we could talk about that rod of iron in terms of like, mm-hmm. is that the gospel message setting captives mm-hmm. free, that kind of thing? Is it is it actual physical rulership and political yeah. rule? Um, what what many people would be scared to call theocracy or something like that. So that's kind of where it, yeah. it, it gets. Uh, I don't want to be too. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Yeah, that's always a concern of mine. No, that's that'd be interesting too. How to do that? Because I think minimally we could say starting the direction you did, which is it's the gospel, but I also think it's the consequences of sin. So the mm-hmm. day you eat, you'll surely die. The wages of sin is death. And he rules with that like an iron rod. It doesn't change. And the nations yeah. have been in a long attempt to get around death. They want life and they don't want the consequences of sin. So I think that's another part of it is the gospel plus this is unchangeable. You're not going to get around the death that comes from sin. Yeah, absolutely. Now um, the the seven kinda... so the seven cycles what what we start to notice in them is they describe this battle and the battle takes ha, has some common themes throughout all seven and it's the battle I think from essentially from the cross until the nations being discipled and the battle goes with Christ riding out and he's the one who unfolds history or he's the one who tells the angels to pour the bowls so Christ is in charge the whole time and suffering is used whether it's unsealing one of the seals or pouring the bowls or the the uh, trumpets, suffering is used as a judgment on the unbelievers and as protection for the believers from unbelievers, but then also as a call to repent. So a moment ago, I said that the world wars are what made premill dispensationalism become popular because people thought I, the, the world, is, I guess, is all over. And there's consequences for having bad eschatology because in the, in the world's eyes, Christian eschatology is just a laughing stock. And that's one thing I wanted to rescue Revelation from with my commentary is to say, no, this is a very serious book. But it is true that Christians, when we get it wrong, it becomes silly. I mean, the, the late great planet Earth in the 70s were still going, didn't end. And he made millions of dollars off that. So people know this stuff. Harold Camping, what was that, around 2006 or something, said it's all going to be over. He shut himself in his house. And he had a great ministry otherwise on the radio and just destroys it with this stuff. So... What Christians should have seen in the world wars was God judging Europe, yeah. colossal judgment on Europe, destruction of Europe altogether. And Europeans, instead of repenting, which is what they should have done, they should have said, yeah, we've really gone off. We've really gone into sin. We need to repent. They hardened themselves. So now it's the most atheist place on earth, the furthest mm-hmm. from God on earth. And that's the pattern that you see in the scriptures, that when God rules and he judges, those are the two options. Either people double down on their sin, which Europe has done. Or they repent and turn to God. And so that's what I mean when I say Revelation teaches us how to read history, not in a the sense that the pre-mill does where you open the newspaper and it has, says Iran and you say, oh, that must be the beast. But in the sense of you know how God rules the nations, how he judges them. And when you see these things, you can say, yeah, that, that nation's being judged. And you might need to apply that to ourselves as we see people ruling us who are wicked and godless. And we'll say, well, that's not just an accident. That's God judging right. us for our unfaithfulness. Right. Yeah. So that's uh, kind of a, a pl- a- application question for somebody who is reading revelation, in their quiet time, you know, as they kind of come across these, these bowls, these seals, these judgments, mm-hmm. these kind of things. I think one thing I'm always cautious of is like, I don't want to do the disby kind of like jump where it's trying to correlate it too much. And yet at mm-hmm. the same time, we can over-spiritualize it to where these judgments yeah. don't apply. So is it fair to, in our prayer life or in our, our ministries, I'm a pastor, uh, a parishioner could come to me and be like, hey, I've been considering world events. I've been looking at Revelation. There seems to be some correlation here between you know this particular bowl or these kind of events and, and the seven cycles mm-hmm. with what's going on in this place. Are, are those 
fair? Like, do those fit into kind of the post mill reading or are those still too dispensational? Well, let me make sure I understand if, if what they're saying is, I think we're on bowl number five and we're about sure. to move to bowl number six. I say, no, that's, that's the sequential view. And yeah. that's a problem. It's not as if God first sent out plagues and then he stopped with plagues altogether and he sent out famine and then he stopped with famine. He sent out just, that's not, that's not what it means. It means that these are being poured out on the world. But if what he meant was, Hey, it seems like the middle East is under judgment. I've been, I've been going through, I'm, I'm in a series on John right now, and I'm reading a number of books on John and on Galilee and first century Palestine. It was a lush place filled with life, filled with farms. It was beautiful. Look at it now. I mean, you don't even see plants growing there anymore. So right. if your parishioner says, hey, it seems like we can take some of these and start to read history. Yeah, I think you're right. That's what it's for. And, and I do have a whole section right at the beginning explaining the numbers and the images by looking at what they were in the Old Testament and helping us there because Christians might get lost in Ezekiel too. But we look at what they were there. Okay. And so then we say, okay, Paul, or, or sorry, John's using them there here in the same way. And here's what they meant. And that takes away some of the numerology that some Christians can get into of trying to calculate, okay, it's this many days from the time Jesus ascended. And so that would be 2039 on October 5th. So I take away all that by saying, no, here's what they meant in the Old Testament. And here's what they mean here. And I, th I hope what it does is it makes it a very readable book. It takes away some of the difficulty and mystery in the bad sense of mystery of I don't get it. And it makes it one that Christians can say, yeah, I really, I do get this now. I see what John was doing. And I even do something. And here's how I'm going to sell my book on your show. I tell everyone the name of the beast. But I'm not oh, going to wow. tell you on the show because it is the number <laughs> 666. And so some people say, well, that must have been Nero. Uh, but no, that's the historical sequential view that says, and then Nero came and he's the beast and now he's done. And there's, you know, that that's actually probably that that's that preterism that the Jesuits invented because they wanted to take the heat off the Pope because the, yeah. the Pope was being focused on as the Antichrist. And the Jesuits said, no, this is all in the past, way before us. Um, so sure. no, no, it's not Nero, but it is it is a number and it is a name. And I got this from a reformer. I didn't invent it myself. So that's, <laughs> that's going to sell the book, I think, because your audience is going to say, I want to know who this is this guy. I got to know the number. That's great. Well, you yeah, got it. You, you can search, but don't tell people. Make them buy it. I will not tell people. All right. Um, yeah, I think your book accomplishes a purpose. I mean, as I was reading through it, I was like, this is so readable. This is very approachable. It doesn't seem that complicated. So I really appreciate the book. Where can people go pick up a copy? It's on Amazon. Um, so just go there. Look up Dr. Owen Anderson. You'll see my books. And I have a web page. The, the press that put this out generalrevelationpress.com, which has its own webpage with my other books. I've been doing something starting this fall where we're putting out one smaller, more devotional book every month. So we started that's with great. a book called The Sum of Saving Knowledge. And that's a little book written by uh, a reformer. And it was usually put with a confession in the 1700s. So you'd publish them together. But it's a really useful book about saving faith. And then last month we did I did one called The Trial of John Bunyan, which is kind of hard to get a hold of. You can get the collected works and you'll see it in there. But it's basically the transcripts of his trial before the judges. And it's absolutely fantastic uh, because I, someone great. who teaches the trial of Socrates, this blows away yeah. Socrates in terms of what he did in in preserving freedom of conscience and his skill in arguing from the Bible. There's a couple things I love. I'll tell you guys one of them and I'll leave the other one as a mystery. After a couple rounds, the judge says to John Bunyan, what's your education? And he says, I'm a tinker. I don't have any education. I can barely read or write. And it just blows your mind because he's the greatest, most published English literary author outside the King James Bible. He's number two. Right. Even, even yeah. atheists recognize Pilgrim's Progress as a work of great literature. And it just shows you God can use people in incredible ways. And then the second thing, which I think your readers will love, is his wife is goes before the judges and is in, in, in and has a back and forth. And she's brilliant also. And it's, it's just just a great dialogue. So we did that one also. You'll see those on either Amazon or on that web, the General Relation Press webpage. That's great. All right. I'll put a link to both of those in the show notes for listeners. I'll put a link to the Substack and all that good stuff. Thanks. Anything else uh, listeners should know, Owen, before we sign off? No, like I said, I appreciate your your support just by going to Substack. It doesn't cost anything, but it really helps to have people there supporting it, liking it in order to show 
ASU and anyone else watching that people are tired of the kind of nonsense Christians are put through in the secular university and Christians should be treated with the same respect that everyone should be treated with. Absolutely. All right, Owen, thank you so much for coming yeah. on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great to see you again. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Foolproof Theology. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I always want to remind my listeners about the Patreon. You can go over to the Patreon in the show notes, sign up, get early access to all episodes, unless, of course, it's a holiday and sometimes I forget. But in general, early access to every episode. You can also get swag over there, signing up at 5 or $15 a month, and you can support the podcast in that way. I need your support. It's a great way to support me as I put out all this content online uh, generally for free. And so please support the podcast. Help me bring great content to you. I need to do studio upgrades, all that kind of good stuff. And your support is indispensable to me bringing great content to you. So head over to the Patreon, sign up today. The link's in the show notes, and we'll see you next time.